Easter Sabbath. Um, my name is Brother Sider, and Bishop Godfrey, who is presiding at this meeting, has asked that I conduct. Uh, I want to express our appreciation to Brother Moulton and to Sister Holmes, who are helping with the music, as well as for Sidney uh, Godfrey, who provided these flowers. I'm so short, I was worried they were going to have to bring it down and they start getting crushed, but I think they're surviving. Um, but welcome to those of you who are visiting as well. Um, send a special welcome to you. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin our meeting uh, by singing hymn number 200. Christ the Lord is risen today, after which with our Cain and Bradley will offer our invitation. <laughs>
work order state business to take care of today, so we will move into the second portion of our meeting by seeing him number 182. We'll see all held to Jesus' name, uh, after which the priest of brethren will minister the second.
express our appreciation to these priests and brethren for the reverent manner in which they have prepared for us to pass the sacrament today and would invite them to and sit with their families. As they were passing, I was thinking about the meaning of today and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and just the atonement in general and realizing how much we need these priests and brethren to minister the sacrament and grateful for them. We have a number of individuals participating today in our meeting. Um, we'll first hear from Carson Sider. Following Carson, we'll hear from Ed Wood. Then Ian Harvey. Following Brother Harvey, we will have a musical number by the primary. And they will sing, Did Jesus Really Live Again? Following the primary, we will hear from Brittany Merriweather and Scott Sweat. And following the sweat, the war choir will sing, Behold the Wounds in Jesus' Hands. And the folk these songs will be accompanied by Christy Moulton. And we'll go to that point and we Carson. Uh, um, so Bishop asked me to introduce this. It's a special issue for the strength of youth. Um, and uh, we were asked to give this out to all the youth in the ward, make sure they got it, and um, I encourage you all to read it. Um, it's titled, uh, Jesus is the Strength of Youth, um, and in the table of contents, each of the sections are labeled um, with something to do with his strength, like uh, strength to overcome the world, uh, strength in your relationship with him, strength to overcome sin, and so on. Um, I, as I was reading through this, I really liked how they had, you know, uh, different styles of writing in it. There were some that were articles, um, quotes from different general authorities, and they had, you know, some lists, you know, one of them was like, um, seven ways to access Jesus Christ's strength, um, and that's kind of what helps me, is if I have, like, something I can go back to, um, every time I need to find strength or I need his love in my life, I need to feel his love in my life. Um, and so we would ask all the youth to come by the bishop's office after the meeting and pick up one of these issues of the strength of youth. Um, I bear my testimony that I know God lives and loves us and that um, we can feel his love and his strength. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We have some great news in our Lord, don't we? When I was 12 years old, I had a terrible nightmare. And I woke from my nightmare um, sweating and shaking and afraid and I stood, went to stand from sleeping and could not move my legs. They, I was just frozen and couldn't move and rolled out of my bed and fell on the floor and was um, at my wit's end and couldn't, I didn't know what to do and I was yelling for help and my dad came into the bedroom and tried to comfort me and um, talked to me softly and helped me um, come to my senses, and then he asked if he could give me a blessing. I said, absolutely, please. And he knelt over me and gave me a blessing. And in the blessing, he said to me, blessed that I would be calm, that I would feel peace, that I would know that my Heavenly Father was with me and that my Savior was my friend and my companion. He also blessed me that my legs would be restored, that I would be able to sleep, and that I would forget the dream. I don't remember the dream that I had, but I remember after the blessing that my dad said to me, you have the strength, the power, and the privilege to draw on our Savior's love and comfort. He also said to me that I am a child of God, that I am significant. And as a 12-year-old, I thought, how can I be significant? I'm just a child. 
How can my Savior know who I am? And so that lingered with me a long time, and throughout my life I have thought about that, that time and that, that feeling of not having any control and the comfort that came to me from the blessing that my dad gave me and the words that he reinforced to me that I am significant. It has impacted me my whole life. As I move forward in my life, I have realized <clears throat> that regardless of the path that I've taken, because there have been times in my life that I have taken a path that has not led me in a way that would be where I would want to be and where I am now. I was um, rebellious, which is my personality. Jeff would attest to that. But I have always known in my heart from that moment as a 12-year-old child that my Savior loved me, that I was significant, that he knew my name, and he loved me. I love to work in the garden. That is my peace. That is where I contemplate many things that have gone on in my life. And I have been witness to miracles as I've had my hands in the soil and gotten the dirt under my nails and seen things grow. But most importantly, I have witnessed rebirth every year, every year. The same things that I have planted and hoped for have come back. And as we celebrate Easter and the rebirth and renewal of of our season. I think about our Savior, and I know that it's cliche, rebirth and, and, and finding newness in all that we do, but it is the truth. We witness this every day, and as I continue to spend time in my garden, as I continue to spend time with my family, as I think about my dad and the experience I have with him on that night, he no longer is with us and has passed away, but that was something that changed who I am. It has given me moments to have a rebirth, a reset, and recognize my significance in this world. And hopefully I can share that message with my children, with my friends, with you. And I have felt your love and the love of my family, which also helps inspire me and impact my life to find newness. And it helps to emphasize that I am insignificant, that I am significant, that I am a child of God. And I leave that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I always ask to speak about Jesus Christ for a few minutes. Um, we all know that Jesus Christ was persecuted. We know the, the story. He was persecuted and <clears throat> ridiculed and uh, eventually crucified and then came back after three days and showed himself, his body. Uh, he made it clear that it wasn't, it wasn't just a spirit, but his body. And he showed himself to the disciples and other people as noted in the Gospels and in the Acts. And he showed them his wounds and his, uh, and his wrists and in his feet and, and in his side and said, peace be with you. I've heard that many times. This morning for the first time, it occurred to me how ironic that is. And it's worth contemplating a little bit. Imagine if that happened to you in your life, someone had this difficult life and then was crucified brutally and then came back, showed you their wounds and said, peace be with you. You'd be horrified, it'd be disturbing, it would be not a peaceful experience. You wouldn't be having peaceful thoughts. I certainly wouldn't. I think that this message is not peaceful. It's very ironic until you consider the message that Jesus Christ was giving when you consider the, the context and the message, it's very peaceful, it's very reassuring. And so I think the contrast is worth considering. Ambiguity is needed 
for us to develop and exercise faith. It's important. There have been many instances where people have witnessed things where it was crystal clear that the gospel was true or that Jesus lived or miracles happened and so on. Uh, but it's also worth considering that Jesus Christ showed himself to the Nephites and at the time everyone recognized and knew that he was the Christ and it didn't take but a few generations until they had almost complete apostasy. So we can't uh, discount the importance of faith and the necessity for us to have opportunities to uh, exercise our faith. Having had said that, the prophets, many, many prophets foretold the life and coming of Jesus Christ. So, including John the Baptist, but when Jesus was born, they knew that the Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem. They knew what his life was going to be like and what his mission was. They knew that. It was a known thing. Uh, prophets had written about it and spoken about it for a long time. Christ himself said that he was the Christ. Christ himself foretold his, the persecution and his crucifixion. And then it happened. And then he came back as foretold and then showed him, showed the people his body, his wounds, and then said, peace be with you. To me, the message is that everything that you were told, everything you heard is true. I am the Christ, or he was the Christ. The gospel is true. It's that good news that we can all rejoice for. He was testifying of the, of the truth of what the prophet said, what he said, of, of, the, of the truth of what he said, not just about his life, but about the gospel. And to me, that, that, that puts this peace be with you in a very different context, and it makes it a, a, a testimony of the greatest story ever told, the greatest thing that ever happened, um, and a reason for each one of us to kind of get out of bed with joy in our hearts every morning. Christ is risen, and the gospel is true. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Easter. Um, got a squishy in my hand, I didn't even realize I had it, so I'm going to squirt up here. Thank you, children. Um, I've been asked to speak on how Christ has impacted my life, and I think that I can make this a really short talk by saying, how has Christ not impacted my life? Because it's true in every single way there is his imprints on my life continually. Um, whether it be from when I was a Sunday or a nursery, I have core memories um, and those moments where I've been instilled with the knowledge that I have a Savior who loves me. And it's some things that are simple as playing London Bridges and nursery with nursery leaders and feeling the love while I um, participated in church activities. Or in sharing time of singing songs like I'm a Child of God. Or my favorite, as my cousins continually, like my much older than me cousins, um, told me that I would always be walking around building out, I'm like a star shining brightly. Um, it was during the sacrament meeting, uh, after being baptized especially, and learning how the Spirit talks to me. I remember one instance in primary when I, um, it was maybe like a month after I'd been baptized, and one of my um, classmates had been baptized just a little bit before I had, and they asked her to give her talk, and she really didn't experience about how um, the Holy Ghost had prompted her to go into her home because she had been playing outside and something was wrong and she needed to go inside and she found her little brother and he was in some kind of trouble. And if she hadn't listened and gone about the help that needed, he would have died. Um, and I remember thinking, as a newly baptized member, why haven't I felt the Spirit like that? How come the Holy Ghost hasn't talked to me like that? It was a very profound moment, she said. She said, I knew clear as day, without a doubt, that it was the Holy Ghost and that he was prompting me. So I started, um, as a young child, trying to figure out how the Spirit spoke to me. And I decided that through my life, the way that I am a father and Jesus, um, wanted me to recognize that spirit and to have that impact in my life is through my transgressions. <laughs> I am one who had to often, I'm not going to say like that because I was probably very good, but I was slightly more on our rebellious side. Um, I had to be humbled a little bit growing up. Um, whether it was because was in a shouting contest with a neighbor friend of ours walking down the street and she said something back to me and I was going to have the last word and my last word stuck. They were not kind. And they were not how my Savior would have wanted me to treat one of his children. And I remember my activity leaders and one of them who lived down the street as us, um, she heard it and she called to me and she said, but what you said was not nice. And she called me out, and I was defensive, of course, and, well, she said, and she said it doesn't matter what she said. You said something much more. And I remember being home in that instance and feeling, then, how my Savior would want me to go about that, and that was to ask me for forgiveness. And I remember being so scared, because it's hard to say, you're sorry sometimes. And even sometimes even more so when you feel justified in your actions, right? To seek that forgiveness. But I did. I went to her house and I apologized. And I remember that feeling later of that I did well. Then juxtaposition is also being able to give forgiveness, right? I had to also be forgiving to her for the things that she said to me. Um, these are some of the ways that Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ has impacted my life. Um, but it's through those like repentance moments, I think, that have made 
a big impression, but not only them, because that's important, because we're all fallible. We don't always do what's right. But there are other impacts that our Savior gives us, whether it's through comfort in times when there's a death of a loved one. Um, I'm turning about loved ones who say they might not be on this earth much longer, right? Um, uh, I remember being in high school, well, no, graduating high school, just started my first semester of college, and my parents called us home over one weekend. And my dad had been sick for a while, and he'd been hiding his symptoms and things that were going on, and they sat us all down, and he said, um, the doctor said dad has six months left to live, prepared, and it was, we don't know what it is, and just hope for the best, say your verse. And that was kind of in a very difficult time frame of my life. It was when I was first out of my house, away from my family, and getting to make my own choices and spread my wings and solely responsible for myself and my own care. Um, but that was a big time when the Savior brought people into my life to bring in that comfort, um, specifically my husband now. Um, I think we're placed in each other's lives or they're placed in our lives specifically for right moments, whether it's for our learning or our opportunity to help others learn and to grow. Um, whether it's moments like with my dad and Jay coming into my life and helping to become that anchor and to help me to realize that things would still be okay. Um, whether it was during my senior basketball season and a lot of things going um, politically wrong, I ended up choosing a harder path um, instead of following the crowd because of uh, instance where another player was ostracized and wrongly so, and because I decided to stick by her side and have integrity, I drew the line of fire as well, and went from being a starting player to even missing out on practices. Um, but I knew what I was standing for was right, and standing by her side. Um, um, whether it's also times when In that moment where others like recognize you as well and, and let you know that you're doing what's right. I had a teacher who recognized that at the time and said, what you're, what you're doing is right. What you're facing is hard, but keep doing it. And I think that's how Jesus helps to impact our lives is through those people in our lives that either call us out when we said mean things to another person and say, do better and ask for forgiveness, or whether it's you're doing what's right and is that affirmation for that. I know our Savior gives us those uh, ways to grow and to improve that he's in our lives continually, that it's not um, ever a moment where He's not in our lives, and that doesn't have um, an impact for us. Um, I felt it through the times when my daughter had cancer as well, and then the times after where she's had clean scans, and uh, I can testify of our Savior's love for us in these moments throughout our lives. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Lord. I want to start out by giving a shout out to the primary kids. Good job, guys. Great song. It really makes Easter special to hear the primary. I also was asked to speak about how the Savior has impacted my life. And like Sister Meriwether, I would 
probably start out by saying it'd be a lot easier to talk about how he hasn't impacted my life. But knowing that, I wanted to pick a couple of ways that I felt uh, that has been most helpful to me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list those as peace and happiness. And to start with, I want to read one of the, my favorite scriptures, and it's a scripture we all know, Matthew 11, and verse 28, that says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, we all labor, and we're all heavy laden, and we're heavy laden with many things, whether we're heavy laden with, with transgression, whether we're heavy laden because we've got employment issues, whether we've got wayward children, whether we've got difficult marriages, or whether we've got health issues. There's so many ways that we end up being laden, being burdened, and having to labor through life. One of my most difficult times happened many years ago, and without going into detail, it was a situation that I could not fix. It was a situation that could not be fixed. But it had left me hurting. It had left me hopeless. It had left me angry. And I, I was mad. And I was miserable for many days. Now, I knew what I needed to do because I had had a, a long line of uh, good primary Sunday school and parents that have taught me what I needed to do. But it took a long time before I approached the Lord. But when I did, I felt love that I can't hardly describe. I felt peace in my life. I felt compassion. Nothing changed. The situation didn't change. The facts were still there, but everything changed. Everything changed because I changed. And throughout my life, never to that critical time of the one time, but I've had those type of situations, and I know you have too, of where when you go to the Lord, when you draw into the Savior, the Savior will give you rest. And the rest doesn't necessarily take anything away. It just makes our life better and makes us happier. The second part where I get happiness comes from, frankly, the same scripture, wherein he follows on, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we take the Savior's yoke upon us, in my mind that is when we're serving, whether we're serving family, whether we're serving neighborhood, whether we're serving in the gospel, as King Benjamin told us, when we're in the service of our fellow man, we're in the service of our God. That's when we have the yoke of the Savior. And you know, the happiest people I know are those who I see out yoked and serving. And one of the reasons that the yoke is easy and the burden is light when we're yoked with the Lord is we're not wearing His yoke, we're sharing His yoke. And he is right there working with us and taking what little bit I can do and magnifying it tenfold to create great results from my little bit of efforts. Brothers and sisters, it's my testimony that when we come into Christ and when we take his yoke upon us, our life is happier, our life is more jo joyful. It won't take away our trials, it won't take away our difficulties. But it'll make it so that we can withstand those tough times. We can learn what we're here to learn. And we can stay on the path to return back to our Father in Heaven. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
morning, brothers and sisters. Um, I would just like to thank Paul Sire for, um, for extending the opportunity to speak to you today on um, one of the greatest days um, that we can remember our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to not only speak, but to also be pondering throughout the week of what I wanted to share and what I wanted to say, and of course there's many things, and the one thing that I thought would be best to convey my message was to speak to our primary friends um, and our youth. I have the great opportunity to work with both of them, um, and I appreciate their love and their admiration for the Savior that they have. Uh, when I was wondering what to to share with you, the two great commandments would always just come back to my mind, to love God and to serve your neighbor. And when we think of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that's what he did. He served, and he shared his love for each one of us. And as primary friends and as the youth, we have a great opportunity to share our simple knowledge of the gospel with others um, out of the mouth of babies. <laughs> Always, they have some fun things to say and some fun things to share, and I, I love seeing their little spirits and that opportunity to learn from them and to to show to show their love of the Savior Jesus Christ. Um, sometimes we don't know if we have a testimony of our Savior. Sometimes we don't understand what the Savior did. And as we learn and grow and as we listen and we study, we develop that relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes it can be hard. Sometimes it comes easy. Um, sometimes times it can be trying and difficult. And um, I always know that if I don't feel of my Savior's love, um, that his love is unconditional. But when I don't feel of that love, I need to pray for the desire to feel of that love. Um, to understand that Jesus does love me and all that I do. Um, he's there for me 100%. He's given me the perfect example of how to serve others and how to love. Um, as we follow the example of Jesus Christ and as we look to him for opportunities to share and to love and to grow, we develop that relationship with him, and that becomes personal. Having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ on his end is easy because he loves us. On our end, sometimes it can be a little more difficult, but as we cultivate that relationship, it can grow. Just as Ev said in the garden, I do like to pretend I'm a gardener, but I'm really not. Um, but it takes time and it takes effort. And as we see that time and effort, we can feel and we know of the, the reward and the relationship that, that comes with that hard work. Um, also, I know that our Savior wants us to come as we are. He doesn't want us to be perfect before we can have a relationship with us, with Him. He wants us to come as we are, as we are in this very moment. He wants us to come broken. He wants us to come saddened. He wants to be able to help us know of his love and of our Heavenly Father's love. I'm very thankful for this chance that I have to be a part of this work family and, and neighborhoods and, and friends and rub shoulders with some of the greatest people. I just want you to know how much I do love my Heavenly Father and my Savior Jesus Christ and especially my old primary friends. That they keep us humble and keep us on the right track always. So I just want to let you know how much I love our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can I say these things in Jesus Christ? Amen. So I did a quick test message to the Godfrey family and said, should I give my talk or cut it? And uh, Cooper did one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts with you. It's good to be here. Um, how has Christ impacted my life? I want to tell you a quick farm story. So I grew up on a, on a farm in Cache Valley. 
on the Utah Idaho border. And we had, between the family, about 400 acres that we ran. And it was about 20 miles from town to our farthest piece of property. And when you run that much ground, equipment breaks down all the time. Um, think of changing a tractor tire 20 miles from town um, with no power tools. And that was, that was kind of how I grew up doing stuff like that. And um, when I was 15, we got this new piece of equipment. It was a power impact wrench. Not the fancy ones you see now. This was like hooked to your truck and your cigarette lighter. And um, it was in a big case and you could hook it up and, and break loose um, bolts from tractor tires. And um, that tool changed the way we did work on the farm. We could suddenly do things much faster and easier. And it was easier for us to get things done. It wasn't, we still had trials and we still had issues, but it made it easier, that tool made it easier. And if I look at, if I compare that farm story to how it's Christ impacted my life, um, he's changed everything. That piece of equipment changed the way we worked on a farm. And Jesus Christ in my life has changed everything. Um, Peace that comes from daily repentance. Um, peace that comes from reading the scriptures in the morning. The glimpse of the love that our Savior has for each of you that I see when I sit on the stand and when I stand in this pulpit. And I get to feel that love. Um, the amazing young men and young women that I get to serve with on a daily basis. Um, my amazing family are all examples of how Christ has impacted my life. The definition of impact. Um, strongly affected by something. And if I think of the Savior's hand in my life, He has strongly affected everything about me and everything that I do. And I'm grateful for Him. I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve and to stand before you this day and testify of our Savior. I know without a doubt that He lives. I know without a doubt that He knows every person in this congregation today. He knows you, he loves you, and he wants you to come back to him. And I leave you with my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
we're so grateful to be here today. We're grateful for this beautiful meeting that we've had and for the lovely testimonies and the beautiful music. We truly love you. We love thy son. We pray that we will have thy spirit to be with us today and we will remember who we are and Remember to be like our Savior. We truly are grateful for our leaders in this chapel that we have to meet in. We truly are grateful for all that we have, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.